praise the Lord, brethren. Um, welcome to this day that the Lord has made, that we may rejoice and be glad in him. We are grateful that we have life. We are grateful for what God is doing in our lives. Um, as my sister said, let us just pray. Father, we give you glory. Lord, we are grateful. We thank you because you are a good God. You are a faithful God. We thank you, King of Kings, because you are a rock. You are a fortress. You, you are the one who fights a battle, King of Glory. We are grateful for life. We are grateful for protection that you've protected us to this time. You've provided for us, King of Glory. We do not take for granted. We want to say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you for you always defend us in all that we do. Master, we are grateful. Now we pray, King of glory, that you may minister to us, that you may speak to us. I pray, King of kings, that I may decrease as you increase. I pray, Lord of lords, that your name may be glorified. Speak to us. Teach us. Teach us, Lord. Correct us. Encourage us and guide us in the way you want us to go. Lord, we give you all the glory. I pray for your children that are on the call and those that are not yet on call. Father, I pray that you may cause them to listen to your voice, that they will not listen to Harriet, but they will listen to the word of God. Father, I pray that any word that is my own that may not come forth, but that what you speak is what will come forth for your children. Lord, we give you glory. We give you praise. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you once Amen. again. Um, I want to say thank you to the Lord for giving me this opportunity. I want also to say thank you to the cathedral administration for a time like this. As Maureen has said, um, our theme is Christ, one of salvation. But we also know the theme for the month is I am in your midst, which is coming from Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. But today we will not look at that. We are going to look at Christ being the horn of our salvation, being the horn of salvation. And our scripture reference comes from Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 69. I will read from NIV. This time I'll read from NIV. And verse 67 says, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. And verse 70, as, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Uh, I want to continue a bit to show us mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he saw to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. You can read through and through to verse 80, but we are looking at at Christ being the horn of our salvation. And um, this caused me to, to start to think of what is a horn. What is a horn? Before I even go into the verse analysis, I, I thought of looking at what a horn is. And the dictionary says, the, the English dictionary says a horn is a permanent outgrowth, often curved and, and pointed found in pairs on heads of cattle, sheep, goats, etc., and consisting of a core bone, which is fixed onto the skin. So when you look at the head of, a, of, a, of an animal, you, you see the horn. <laughs> and in most of the animals, there are two horns, but they are hard, they are firm, it's made of bone, and it's very strong. That is what the English says. Horns are on uh, animals' weapon. The, the animals use it as a as a weapon, so it follows that as a symbol they function as representing strength and aggressiveness. When we are looking at the horn, they on the cut of us before we look at the horn in the Bible, it represents strength and aggressiveness. 
they are also the power and dignity of, of an animal. And uh, they use it for war. When you look at uh, bulls, when they're fighting, the one with a, a, a bigger horn has greater power than the one with a smaller horn. So it is also a, a sign of strength. Then we, we, we've also said, we've said Christ is the horn of our salvation. We've seen what the horn on the animals are. We also want to think of the horn as in the Bible. Horns are used for defense or for protection. It's used as a symbol of protection. It symbolizes that we are, we are in the right place under the care and ownership of a strong king. If we say that Christ is our horn of salvation, then we know that, that we are under the ownership. We are under the care of a strong and powerful king. When we think of the horn of salvation, of God, it means that he defends and assumes care for his own. Because if Christ is our horn of salvation, we have just said that for animals, they use horn for protection. Now for us, if Christ is our horn, then how strong are we? So before we, we think of that, I, I also saw this verse, which I got interested in, in Psalm 75 verse 10 says, all the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So we can see when we talk of Christ being our horn, Christ is the one that will crush all the wicked horns. Any, any horn that, anything that comes looking so powerful, because we are saying that the horn is a sign of strength, is a sign of protection, but any wicked thing that comes against us and it looks so strong. We have the courage, we have the ability to know that Christ will destroy it all. So let's go back to Zechariah. Zechariah is one of the minor prophets. Um, and uh, the Bible says he was a righteous man. He was a uh, wife. The wife was called Elizabeth before God, keeping all his commandments and all his ordinances. They were blameless, but you know, the Bible says they were righteous. They were walking right before God. They were blameless. They were keeping all the commandments of the Lord. Then it comes up in the earlier verses and say, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. They were barren. They, Elizabeth was barren. They didn't have a child, but they kept praying. They kept believing God and they believe that one day God will deliver them. But desiring to, 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 to show them mercy since they, were, since they were pious before the Lord, they kept praying and one day an angel appeared to, to, to Zachariah. And the angel was bringing the good news that now is prayers, their prayers had been answered and the angel told them, told Zechariah that he was going to get a son. God was giving him a son. But then the earlier verses has already told us that, that he, they were advanced in age. So when the angel told him that Zechariah could not, he was, he was not believing that at that age he can get a child. Just, just take a picture of a lady. This does not happen so much in, in town, but it happens so much in the village. If you do not have a child and you have stayed for long in the village, uh, people have gotten children after you, you know, there's a way that community and the kind of life they were, they were living, what they were going through. And that could explain why it was not very easy for Zachariah to, to, to believe that, that what the angel is saying is true. So before we even go to look at, at Christ being the horn of our salvation, let's look at this life of Zachariah. You know, it's very easy to point and say, but why couldn't he believe? But then come back to ourselves. We already know that Christ is the horn of our salvation. I believe most of us on this call, we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And we know that he's more powerful than anything. But how many times has the angel or the Holy Spirit 
Spirit spoken to us and we have not believed? How many times have we doubted the strength of this horn of us salvation? How many times have we questioned, but how can it be? Let it even, let's take an example of maybe a simple sickness. You are having a headache and you pray and the Holy Spirit drops in your heart that you are healed. Or it is a deliverance service and you, you, you have walked out, you stepped out and you are prayed for. And, 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 and the, 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 the pastor tell, am I really healed? This is it. not believing what angel Gabriel was telling him. So I, I do not want us to, 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 to let it be so far-fetched that it's not exactly that. It happens to us in our Christian walk. We find ourselves in the state of Zechariah, child of God. I want to bring this even clear to us even before I talk about the horn of salvation, that we should know and we should accept and be able to believe that Christ the horn of our salvation is our protector, is our everything. So as a result of that, Zechariah was dumbfolded for nine months. For nine months, he was silent. He, he wasn't talking. He, he was using sign. I'm not so sure whether he was hearing because at a, at the, a later time when now they had the son, the, the Bible tells us that they were asking for the name and what they did was they, they wrote for him the question and he wrote back on the paper. But then let's look at Zachariah's silence and solitude. I think this, this was like, his silence may have been a divine rebuke for his unbelief. It could have been a way of God telling him to take more time and listen and focus. <coughs> it could be a way of God speaking very loudly to Zechariah. How many times have we been silent? I know last year we got uh, a patient who lost her ways for six months. And she, by, by the second month, she could not even whisper anymore. And I believe that is a very uncounted many times. And you know what, when that pain comes, it reminds you that you have actually lost your voice. So have you reached the point where you have in silence, where you've kept silence to meditate on the message of the cross. When you're missing your fortress, in your all intention and listen to this king, we wake up early, drop children at school, you, you have ABCD to do, and you'll find that your time of listening to the Lord is very limited. Your time of recognizing Christ as your strength, recognizing Christ as your stronghold, it's very limited. So do we want to reach that level where the angel will tell us that we are going to be silenced until, until the, the, the miracle is, is, is that is not what we want to see. We want to be able to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We want to be able to acknowledge Christ being a rock, being a being a everything. So Zachariah was silent for nine months and I have said that I want to take it that that was a rebuke God trying to, but also, there would have been negative words that would nullify that's where you live. The people in your workplace where you live, they know that you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you know that Christ is the whole of your salvation. But then, what do we speak? What do 
do we speak about this hall of our salvation? What message do we give to the people around us? Do they see the strength? So I was talking about who we are at our places of work. Knowing Christ as our home of salvation. Knowing Christ as the solid rock on which we stand. What picture do we give where we are? Do we still portray, portray this Christ as the rock of our salvation or is something else? Because we do not want to reach this level where we are put in silence like Zechariah. So may God help us that even where we are, our testimony is clear. Our testimony is very clear about Christ being our rock of salvation. So when we look at, at the horn of salvation, I've already said the horn is a sign of, of strength. So when we read in the Bible, we've already seen Zechariah chapter, in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 69, which is talking of Christ being the horn of our salvation. The Bible uses phrases of one of salvation a number of times. We, we find it in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 3. The, the horn of salvation is referencing along with us other attributes of God, like the refuge, the, the shield, the stronghold. And when we also go to Psalms chapter 18, verse 2, also references the horn of salvation in the passage that mentioned other descriptions of God such as the rock, is a fortress, is a deliverer. So in case you've not yet got what it means by Christ being the horn of our salvation, I think this verse of Psalms 18 verse 2 tells us of that. Is a rock, is a fortress, is a shield, is a deliverer. So is the solid rock on which we stand. So Luke chapter 1, verse 69 is a special usage of the term of horn of salvation. It refers to Zechariah's prophecy where he speaks of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Old Testament speaks of Jesus, but when we come to the song or the prophecy, you know, after Zechariah was silenced for all this time, when, when his lips open and they ask him the name of the, the child, and he said his, his name is John. He did not go ahead and start lamenting, oh, but why did God do this to me? He was still seeing God as the strong one, the strong God. He was still seeing God as the deliverer. He was still seeing God as the shield, as the refuge, as the rock, because this term is what describes Christ, is what describes Jesus. And this rock protects us, provides us with spiritual strength, Christ as our rock, he protects us, he provides spiritual strength, and he will never be turned over to others, other spiritual enemies. Whatever enemy will come against us, as long as we have Christ as our horn of salvation, then nothing can overcome us. And there, that means that the victory will always belong to us. So if you are to remember what Christ being the horn of our salvation is, remember that it symbolizes strength. It symbolizes strength of who Christ is in our life. And it, interestingly, when you read Psalms 18, you will understand. So when Zechariah's lips were open, he did not go into rumors, as I said. Because if it was me of these days and I have been quiet for nine months and now my lips are open and I also have a son, I think the first thing I would do would be to ask for the son and to, to, be, to celebrate the son, to, you know, to, to, to show everybody. But for, 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 so for Zechariah, it was not so. When his lips opened, he started by praising the Lord. He started by being excited about the coming king. He started by prophesying about Christ, the savior. So most of Zachariah's song is taken up when we, when we read the song after the, our theme verse, it's taken up into, into praises, into praising the Messiah. 
when you read verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel because he has visited and redeemed these people. When we read this, we, we, see four, we see things that Zechariah was referring to. Nine months earlier, Zechariah could not believe his wife would have a child. Now, filled with the Holy Spirit, he is so confident of God rede God's redeeming work in the coming Messiah that he puts it in the past tense. For the mind of faith, a promised act of God is, a, a good, is, a, is as good as done. If God promises something, it's not a son of man that he will change his mind. If God promised to give you a son, he will give you a son. If God promised to give fish, he will give fish. He will not give snake. So Zechariah was so sure. And Zechariah has learned to take God at, at his word. And also uh, has learned to, to know the assurance that if God visit, he will redeem us. Secondly, Zechariah talked about the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He talked about the God of Israel as visited and redeemed. You know, for centuries, the Jews were, were waiting. We are waiting for, for this redemption. And they were wondering, will this really come? But you know, when God has said something, he does not withdraw his word. The spirit of prophecy, if it has come and it is of the Lord, it will always come to pass. It will always come to pass. So Zechariah on opening his mouth, he comes out with the prophecy about the Messiah. And that's how he goes ahead. When you go to, to the next verse, verse 69, you find him now talking about the coming Messiah, who is the horn of our salvation. He is coming to, to redeem, to redeem us, even us at our time, if we acknowledge him as our horn of salvation, we will truly be redeemed. Zechariah probably never redeemed that the Messiah would have to die on the cross. But, you know, he, he was taking Jesus as everything. Huh? It took years to get the fact into his disciples' head that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected <clears throat> and be killed. And on the third day, rose again. There had been hints in the Old Testament, but no one could believe because he was coming to redeem the world so who, who is that who can really make sure that he's dead or what? But because of you and I, this Christ, the horn of our salvation, had to die. Had to die for my sake, for your sake, so that we are redeemed. <clears throat> the fourth thing that we notice in verse 68 is that God has visited and redeemed his people. It is the consolation of Israel for which Zechariah hopes. It is the Lord God of Israel who is coming to redeem his people. The people in view of, 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 of Zechariah, when he talks of Israel, that includes us of today. Because Israel was the chosen nation whom God had made promises about. God had the world in view. God had you and I in view. When we talk of Israel, we are looking at us also of today. So this horn of salvation, comes to redeem us, comes to protect us, come to fight our battles, comes to heal us from all our diseases. Christ as the horn of salvation gives us all that, that we want, gives us all that we have ever desired. So Jesus is the horn of salvation because he's a deadly weapon, a tremendous power, which according to verse 71, when you go ahead, God uses to save his people from all their enemies, those who hate you, those who like you, God saves you from them all. So Zechariah's prophecy of saying that Christ is the horn of our salvation gives us assurance of the Messiah, of what he can do for us. He can destroy all our enemies. All you need to do is to trust in this horn of our salvation. All you need to do is to believe in him. When you read ahead and you continue to verses 74, 75, shows that the goal of God's redemption in rising up a horn of salvation is to grant that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. God's aim in raising a horn of salvation 
is not merely to liberate and oppress people, but to create a holy and a righteous people who, who will live in fear because of him, fear of him, not fear of the evil around us. So Christ being our home of salvation means that we are empowered and God now expects us to live a righteous life, to live a holy life, because we know that the one we serve is holy. The one that has called us is holy. This means that the redemption spoken in verse 68 must include redemption from fear of enemies and from all unrighteousness. So you cannot call yourself a believer and yet you are still living the other life you were living before you accepted Christ as the horn of your salvation. So as we come to acknowledge Jesus as the horn of our salvation, we must know what does it require of me to walk a holy life? What does it require of me to be righteous so that Christ may continue to be the horn of my salvation? Child of God, think about this and ask yourself, am I walking righteous so that Christ remains the horn of my salvation? Am I walking without fear, knowing that because Christ lives, I can face tomorrow? And it also implies that, that ultimately the people spoken of in verse 68 are not merely Jews. I've already said that when we talk of, of the Jews, remember, we, we, we who are saved, we have accepted him, we are now part of this. We are now part of Israel. And therefore, to view Jesus as a horn of salvation, is to see him not only as a national liberator, as you know, when, when the, the disciples, when they were expecting Jesus, they knew this Jesus is now our everything. Some people, I imagine if it was in our time, we would be preparing for me, I'll be an MP, for me, I'll be the VP. I think for me, I'll be the prime minister. Oh, for me, I'll be the, the minister for finance because I will want to benefit. You know, it was not about that. He had, he had come to save the whole world. He was not coming as a political leader. He was not coming to say from now, I am the overall president for the whole world. He had come to save all mankind. He was not struggling for power with anyone. So Christ, the horn of our salvation, does not, does not struggle for power in any way because all power belongs to him. All power is his. All power belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so if the goal of God's redemption is to be achieved, the gathering of people who are fearless and righteous <clears throat> then must come up. Then he must conquer. we must conquer fear and we must conquer unrighteousness. We must know that the one that we serve, the one that is our horn of salvation is above all. And the good news of Zachariah's song is the good news of Christmas, is that God has raised up a horn of salvation. So as we are entering into Christmas and we are thinking of celebrating Christmas, what comes into your mind? Are you looking at the Jesus who is born, who is in, who is in, the, who is in the, 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 the manger? Are you looking at Jesus who is the savior? Are you looking at Jesus who has changed the whole world? Or you are just thinking of any, anything, anything that, that the world is offering? How do you treat Christ as the horn of your salvation? What does he mean to you? Is he just the great ox of the great ox, ox horn? The way you look at a horn on a, on a huge Chinyankole cow, and then you say, Yeah, I think my Jesus horn is as big as that one of that cow. I think the people in the Western understand this better. It's more than that. It's more than that. It's so powerful. Even if the Bible tells us all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Yes, we know when you go to Christ in repentance as the horn of your salvation, it definitely sets you free. It definitely sets you free. And also the Bible tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Have you reached that place? 
where you want to have a self-justification and you say, as for me, I have not seen. So I do not need this horn of salvation. After all, the Bible say, all I've seen, so who am I? The horn of salvation causes us to live a fearless life and a righteous life. If we, we do not acknowledge him as the horn of our salvation, we will continue living in fear. We will continue living in sin. But then if we accept him, we will know because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We, 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 we read in Romans, the common verse we know, the wages of sin is death. But then Christ is the one who gives us eternal life. Romans 6, 23, that's a common verse we know. And we also know that, that the Bible tells us also uh, 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 that the, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Christ came that we may have life and have it abundantly. So this horn of salvation has come to give us life, has come to give us eternal life. Not just this life that we see today and tomorrow you hear that, that somebody has died. He has come to heal us of all diseases. So we need to know that and we need to take that into our mind that Christ is the horn of our salvation. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We know that that is 1 John chapter 3 again, verse, verse 8. And Hebrews 9, 26 tells us, Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Fear and guilt, the two great spoilers of life, have been taken away because Satan has been disarmed and sin has been forgiven. If we take Christ as the horn of our salvation, then the, the enemy will have no, no say in our lives. The enemy cannot claim us. Even if he has come to steal, kill, and destroy, we will know that Christ has appeared once for all and to put away sin. But that only happens when we acknowledge Christ as the horn of our salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 15 says, Christ took on a human nature that through death he must destroy him who has the power of death. That is the devil. The deliverer, the deliverer all those and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. You know how the devil can put us in bondage? A sickness can come or a condition can come or even a problem in your office can come. And the devil lets you focus on that problem and you know I am finished. Or maybe a loss of a job. You will know now that I don't have a job, I am finished. I don't have life anymore. But Christ, the horn of our salvation, the provider of all things, the healer, the, our hero, the one that makes us righteous, has come that we may have life. Satan may be, roar, may be a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But none of those who take refuge in Christ will be devoured by Satan because Christ is the horn of our salvation. He can destroy all the arrows of the enemy. Zechariah was silent for nine months. It was a divine rebuke for his unbelief, but God always turns rebuke into reward for those who keep their faith in him. God loves us. And even when he punishes us, he will know that he died on the cross for us. He keeps his arms open, calling us to come back to him. He keeps his arm open saying, my child, come home, come home. You who are weary and laden, heavy laden, come back home, come home, come home. And, and, and the horn will fight all your battles. This horn will fight, fight for us. And we are safe. I think some of us saw a picture that was running on social media of late where some animals were stuck in mud or in mire. And one of them, I don't know what that animal is, is it a cob with very many horns? Went and started knocking the cars gently, gently with the horn. Gently with the horn. And the people in, in the cars were driving away because they know a horn is, is, for, is for strength, is for fighting. 
But then this animal did not give up. It kept moving on, moving on from one car to another. And when it went to the next car, it was just knocking it gently, gently. So this horn is gentle to us, the Christians. So the, this animal, after knocking gently, a man came up and, and ran after the, the animal. The animal goes back to, to the mud and the, the friends were, were, were dying. They were stuck. So the community came up and pulled out and rescued, rescued the animals that were going to die in mud. The horn of salvation. An example of the horn of salvation. Gentle to you, the Christian, but can be so tough to fight your enemy. So the animals did not die because the horn was speaking so gently and caused someone to come out and pay attention. How about you and I, the child of God? How much can this horn of salvation protect us? Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. Is the horn of our salvation. May God bless us as we trust in Christ as the horn. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, our sister Harriet. Thank you for the word. And we praise the Lord for that word that, that has come to us this, this evening. And um, some questions to ask, something to think about. Who is Christ to us? Who is Christ to you? Who is Christ in your place of work? Who is he? Even then, who are you? Do you even know your identity? This is something that kept running around in my head as the preaching went on. And so friends, we are going to respond to the message that we have heard. We are going to respond in prayer and then trust the Lord that he who started a good work in us will bring it to completion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that we have received this evening. We thank you that you are the home of our salvation. We thank you that Father, you call us by your name. That even then we know that we belong to you. Thank you for that assurance, my Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we are called your own. We are called your own, Lord. We don't take it for granted. Thank you for the reminder that you've given us this evening. That yes, you are, you are, you are, you are our home of salvation. And Father, we ask that you continue to build our faith in you. We ask that you continue to build our trust in you. But Father, even then, when we are faced with challenging times, wherever you have placed us in families, in our workplaces, on the roads, wherever you have placed us, Lord, that we shall be faithful. We shall have faith. We shall have trust. Trust in you, Lord. Trust in you, Jesus. Only you, my Father. Only you, Lord. Father, help us to conquer fear. Help us to conquer fear. Sometimes we are taken up by fear, but Father, with you there is nothing impossible. That is what your word says. Father, our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. Our life is in your hand. Everything about us is in you, Lord. We acknowledge the Lordship, the Lordship of Jesus Christ in each and everything, in this nation, in the church, in the family, in the lives of the young people, in the lives of the children. Lord, we acknowledge your Lordship Father, we ask that you'll have your way. You'll have your way. You'll have your way. And Lord, wherever we may be having challenges, wherever we may be having hard times, we ask for strength. We ask for strength, King of Kings. We ask for strength. Fill us with your strength. Fill us with power. Fill us with your word. Fill us. Fill us, Lord. And Lord, in each and everything, be exalted. Be exalted, King of Kings. Be exalted, Father. Lord, we thank you for your servant, Harriet, this evening, who has brought such a word to us this evening. We ask that you will continue to use her. We ask that you continue to nourish and nurture her with your word. Father, we ask for protection over her. We ask for protection over her family, her children, her marriage, her job. That Lord, 
you will continue to be exalted in her life. And Lord, have your way. Have your way in our lives. For those of us who are still on the road, Lord, we ask that you continue to protect us. We plead the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our families, over this nation. Father, we refuse any sort of bloodshed in this land in the name of Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. We enthrone you, Lord. We enthrone you. We enthrone you. We enthrone you in this nation. We enthrone you in the families. We enthrone you. We enthrone you everywhere, Lord. Be exalted. This we pray through Jesus. Amen. Amen.